Hello, and welcome to your principal component analysis lecture. So far, all the unsupervised machine learning we've been doing has been clustering, but I mentioned at the very beginning that that's not the only thing you can do with unsupervised ML. Remember, the goal of unsupervised machine learning is to find latent structure in the data, and one way to do that is to find groups through clustering. However, that's not the only way. Principal component analysis is a method of dimensionality reduction, which is another type of unsupervised machine learning. The idea behind dimensionality reduction is that Often we have a ton of different features in our data and we might not want to use all of them in order to build our machine learning models because that will make them computationally expensive. So the idea with dimensionality reduction is that we somehow reduce the number of variables we need to use in order to make our models more efficient. Now, one method of dimensionality reduction is something called variable selection. This is literally just taking our original features and deciding to drop some of them. For instance, if we're predicting cholesterol, we might decide that the color of someone's shirt is not a variable we need to use and we can just get rid of it. Lasso does variable selection because it actually drops individual variables from our model. One way you can tell something is variable selection is that if it drops a variable, we no longer would need to select that variable in order to run our model. For instance, if lasso drops the color of someone's shirt, we no longer need to record that in order to make our prediction. However, that's not what principal component analysis does. Principal component analysis is a method of dimensionality reduction that doesn't drop individual variables. Instead, it creates a new, more efficient set of variables to describe the information in our data. Let's look at a really simple example. Here we have the GPA and the SAT score for a bunch of different students. Now, one thing you might notice from this plot is that GPA and SAT are incredibly related. Because of this, we could create a new variable, maybe along this axis, and we could call this something like academic test-taking skills that explains the variability in our data with just one single new variable. Essentially, what we're doing is we're combining GPA and SAT score together to create a new score, academic test-taking ability, that explains most of the information in our data. What we're doing is we're basically taking the two axes of our data that people vary along, GPA on the x-axis and SAT score on the y-axis, and we're going to rotate them. When we rotate them, we create a new set of uncorrelated variables that really efficiently explain the information in our data. Because GPA and SAT are highly related, this new feature that we've created really well exemplifies the information from those original two variables. If you sort of tilt your head and look at the screen, you can see that people vary the most along this new axis and not so much on this one. So we're essentially taking our two original variables and creating two new uncorrelated variables that explain the information in the data incredibly efficiently. And how do we create those? Well, with eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So let's review what those are. Eigen decomposition refers to taking a matrix and finding the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. Here's one way to think about this. Say we have four points that form a square. 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and 0, 1. When we take each of these points and we multiply them by a matrix, like the one over here, that's going to change the location of these points. So we go from our square to a different shape. Here's the change that's made when you multiply by this matrix. You can see the original square in gray and the new shape in yellow. Thus, you can think of multiplying by a matrix as just taking that original square and stretching or squishing it in various directions. One thing that can help us understand a matrix is figuring out what those directions of stretch and squish are. For instance, along this blue line that I've added, you can see that we basically took our original square and we just stretched it a little bit. We didn't rotate or change our line in any way, we just made it a little longer. Similarly, along the second axis, we didn't rotate or change anything. Anything. we just squished. These directions of stretch and squish along with the amounts we stretched or squished help tell us a little bit about this matrix. 
So if we want to know a little bit about this matrix, we might want to describe the directions of stretch and squish and how much was stretch and squished. These are the eigenvalues, the amount of stretch and squish, and the eigenvectors, the directions of stretch and squish. So let's talk a little bit of the math of how we do eigen decomposition. Now remember, our goal is to find the directions where we're not actually changing our line, we're just stretching it or squishing it. This is the same thing as saying there's some vector or direction direction, where when we multiply it by our matrix A, it's the exact same thing as taking that vector or line and just multiplying it by an individual value. In order to find these directions and the amount of stretch and squish, we need to solve this equation. Now, I don't expect you to be able to do this by hand, but really quickly, I'm going to go through the math. If you already know how to do this, this would be a great time to review. If you don't, don't worry. All you really need to know is what we're doing is we're trying to find the directions of stretch and squish along with how much we're stretching and squishing. In order to solve for the directions of stretch and squish along with the amounts, we're going to use this formula. This is basically taking the determinant of our matrix minus lambda, which is just a variable, we don't know what it is yet, times the identity matrix. The identity matrix is just a matrix where along the main diagonal, they're all ones, and on the off diagonals, they're all zeros. Essentially what this looks like is we take our matrix, and for all of the diagonal entries, we subtract this variable lambda that we're trying to solve for. Then we need to take the determinant of it. For a two by two matrix, the determinant is just the main diagonals multiplied together minus the off diagonals multiplied together. That gives us this. We can then expand that into a polynomial and solve for the roots. The roots are our eigenvalues. These tell us how much things are being stretched or squished. Here, our eigenvalues are 1.5 and 0.5, which you can see correspond to this direction where we're stretching. Any eigenvalue bigger than one indicates that we're stretching. And this eigenvalue corresponds with this direction. Because it's between zero and one, it means that we're squishing. So once we have these two eigenvalues, we can just plug them back into this matrix that we created. When we do, we get our eigenvectors. These are the directions of stretch and squish. The way you read these is if we started at 0, 0, and we went to the point defined by this vector, so this would be 0 0.71, 0 0.71, this is our direction of, in this case, stretch. This would be our direction of squish. So what does this have to do with principal component analysis? Well, remember, the goal of principal component analysis is to take our original variables and create a new, more efficient, uncorrelated set of variables for us to use. The way we create that set of variables is by using eigen decomposition on the covariance matrix of our data. Remember, the covariance matrix gives us information about the variance of individual features along with their covariance. The variances are in the main diagonal and the covariances in the off diagonal. So when we take this covariance matrix, we can then apply an eigen decomposition to it to get the directions of stretch and squish as well as the amount. On this plot, you can see a scatter plot of our raw data. Here on the axes, you can see that these are just our two original variables. The lines that you see represent our eigenvectors. These are the directions of stretch and squish. These lines represent the new variables that we're going to use in order to describe our data. Here you can see a transform plot where instead of our raw variables, we have our new principal components, the more efficient set of variables. The eigenvectors from our eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix tell us how to create these new features. For instance, for the first principal component, we would take 0.71 times our original variable x plus 0.71 times our original variable y. That combination would give us the value for that data point in our principal component one, the new variable. Similarly, we would take 0.71 times x and negative 0.71 times y in order to get the score for the second new variable. The eigenvectors tell us the loadings. They tell us how much of each of our original variables goes into each of our new variables, the principal components.
And in more complicated situations, the loadings can basically give us an idea of how associated each individual original variable is with each of the principal components we've created. For instance, here, looking at our first principal component, the variables of age, residence, and employment are all pretty strongly associated with our first principal component. But one thing here to notice is that all of our principal components are combinations of all of the original variables. Because we use these loadings to calculate our new principal components, we often refer to them as weights. They basically tell us how much of each of our original variables to put in each of the new principal components. After applying that transformation from original data to principal components, we get our component scores. These are just the values for each data point in our new set of variables. The way we get these is we take those loadings, we multiply them by the original variables in order to get our new score. For instance, if I wanted to find the first person's score for the first principal component, I would take the loadings for that principal component times their original raw values, and that would give me their new score for the first principal component. All right, so one thing you might have noticed is that when we create principal components, even though they're a set of more efficient, uncorrelated variables, we created the same number of principal components as we had original features. That means however many columns we put into the PCA, that's how many principal components come out. But I said that PCA does dimensionality reduction, but so far we haven't done that at all. We put in a set of P variables and we get out a set of P principal components. Well, one thing to remember is that the principal components are more efficient. Even though they're combinations of our original variables, they're created in such a way that the first principal component explains the most information in the original data, the second principal component explains the second most, the third, the third most, and so on and so forth. Because these principal components are in order, and because they're more efficient than our original variables, what we can do is we can get rid of some of our principal components and still have most of the information from our original data. One way to look at this is with a scree plot on the left or a cumulative variance plot on the right. Both of these plots tell us how much of the original variance or information is explained by each of our components. In a scree plot, it just tells us how much variance is explained by each component. Remember they're in order, so the first component explains the most variance, in this case a little above 40%. And that's a lot. 40% of the original information in our data is contained in a single variable, our first principal component. The second one explains a little less than 20, the third a little less than 10, and so on and so forth. As you can see, the last few principal components don't explain a lot of the variation or information in our data. Thus, we typically feel fine just getting rid of them. Now, technically, we are throwing away some information, but as you can see, it's not a lot. So how do we decide how many of our principal components to keep? Well, one way is through the elbow method. This looks at a scree plot and looks at the point of inflection, which is probably around here. The idea with the elbow method is that we'll keep as many principal components as it takes to get to the elbow. In this case, that's one, two, three, four, five. This means we'd only keep five of our principal components, and we originally had 29, so that's a huge reduction in the number of features that we have. And because the principal components that we got rid of explain so little of the information in the data, we're losing a little bit, but probably not much. Another way to choose the number of principal components to keep is to choose a threshold. This threshold represents the percent of the original variance or information that we would like to keep. So for instance, I could set that threshold at 90 95%. Under this method, we're going to keep as many principal components as it takes to reach or exceed that threshold. A cumulative variance plot tells us similar information to a scree plot, but it tells us how much variance is explained by the first n components. So this point tells us how much variation is explained by the first component. This tells us how much is explained by the first two. This tells us how much is explained by the first three, and so on and so forth. Thus, we can use this graph to help us decide how many principal components it's going to take in order to reach or exceed that 95% threshold. 
In this case, it looks like it'll be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 is the first time we cross that threshold. Using this method, we would keep 10 of the original 29 components. Now, this is still a huge reduction. We went from almost 30 features to down to 10, and yet we're still retaining over 95% of the original information in the data. So while we're throwing something away, it's really not much. Remember, principal component analysis takes advantage of the relationships between our variables to create a new, more efficient, uncorrelated set of principal components. One thing that's important to remember is these principal components are each combinations of our original variables. This is why I said earlier that PCA does not do variable selection. Even though we're taking our huge set of principal components and only choosing the first few, each of those principal components is a combination of all of our original variables. For instance, even if I only keep two principal components, I still need to collect all my features in order to calculate those principal components. For this reason, principal component doesn't really do variable selection. We still need to collect all of our variables, and in some way, all of our variables are still influencing our principal components. However, it is dimensionality reduction, because let's say we have 100 features, and we want to use those as predictors in a linear regression. Now, linear regression is pretty simple, but with 100 features, we're definitely increasing the computational expense of that model. However, what if we took PCA and applied it to all of those features and then only kept the first five principal components? Well, now we can use the principal components as predictors and only have five predictors in our linear regression instead of a hundred. Thus, we're doing dimensionality reduction without actually doing variable selection. Another important thing to remember is because the principal components are each a combination of all the original variables, if we use them as predictors in a model, it makes it hard to figure out what the contribution was of any of our original variables. For instance, say we're using age and height and weight and heart rate to predict someone's cholesterol level. If we took our predictor variables, sent them through PCA, and only kept two principal components, both of those principal components are combinations of all of our predictors. That means that it would be a little bit difficult to tease apart the individual contribution of someone's heart rate on their predicted cholesterol level. So while PCA does dimensionality reduction, it can reduce the interpretability of your model. Thus, PCA is best when you need to just make a prediction and don't care about the interpretation, but you do want to have computationally efficient models. So remember, the point of principal component analysis is to take advantage of the relationships in our data to create a new, more efficient set of variables that allow us to explain a lot of the information in our original data in a smaller set of principal components. The way we calculate these principal components is by taking the covariance matrix of our original data and finding the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. The eigenvectors are basically weights that tell us how to combine our original variables to make each new principal component. When we apply that transformation, we get our new component scores. These are the values for our new variables for all of our data points. Because of the way that PCA works, the first principal component will explain the most information, the second, the second most, and so on and so forth. So typically what we do is we get rid of the last few principal components so that we can only use a handful, but still explain most of the information in our data. One last note to leave you with. Remember I mentioned that principal component analysis can make it difficult to interpret the impact of an individual original variable because all our principal components are combinations of all our original variables. Variables. If you want to do something similar to principal component analysis, but want a little bit more interpretability, one thing you might want to look into is factor analysis. All right, that's all I have for you. I will see you next time.